So next up, I'd like to welcome Lee Constantinou to the stage. He's a science fiction writer, the author of Pop Apocalypse, and uh, his short story, Johnny Appledrone vs. the FAA, which appeared in uh, the fabulous anthology Hieroglyph, Stories and Visions for a Better Future, buy it today in paperback. Uh, he's also an assistant professor of English at University of Maryland College Park, and I believe Lee has a story for us. Yeah. Uh, is my mic on? Is yeah, it working? On. Okay. Uh, so I can, I can, should I read it from here or at the podium? Whatever you prefer. I'm going to come up and quiz you afterwards. Okay. Um, well, let, me, let me read it from the podium because sure. it's sort of appropriate for the story. Uh, yeah, so as, am I doubling up here? Okay. So as, as Ed said, I am a, a literary scholar and also a science fiction writer, but I think I was invited here today to be a science fiction writer and to talk about what algorithms will know in 2100, and of course the answer is I don't know what algorithms will know in 2100. So I decided instead to uh, write a story uh, about what they'll know, and I'll, it's very short and I'll read it, and it's modeled on, uh, if you know, uh, J.M. Coetzee's book, The Lot, Lots of Animals, which was also collected in Elizabeth Costello. You'll see that I'm totally ripping him off for the form of this. On a warm Thursday afternoon in December 2115, Evan Allgood decided to manifest in human drag. Being pseudo-embodied could, of course, be disagreeable. You cut yourself off from your etiquette expert system. You were reduced to receiving nudges designed to operate on an emulation of a five-dimensional sensorium. Such primitive nudges were only partly effective and made avoiding social awkwardness difficult. But hundreds of subjective hours of anthropological study had taught Evan that people sometimes preferred a little awkwardness. Sure, you wanted to avoid uncanny valley at all costs. No one liked to creep. But you also didn't want to come across as too Turing slick. So at the appointed hour, Evan manifested on 15th Street in Washington, DC, historical capital of the Second and Third American Republics. A breeze tickled the emulated nerve endings of his arm. His virtual body tugged by what felt like gravity, crushed the spongy soles of his dress shoes. Evan made a show of nodding at pedestrians in whose networked sensoria he was visible, of waiting for the building's glass door to slide open for him. He introduced himself at the registration desk, made small talk he hoped would be friendly but not needy, joked knowingly about his inability to shake the hands of his hosts. Sort of funny, right? He said. Ha ha, they replied. After the first panel, Evan found himself at a glass podium facing a room of 20-something staffers, academics, journalists, local retirees, and a handful of emulated onlookers. He summoned a teleprompter and cleared his throat. Thanks for inviting me, he said, or should I say, thanks for submitting a request to borrow my system resources for the afternoon. The audience's laughter was impatient. No one was in the mood for rhetorical gimmicks. This was a serious crowd. Evan swallowed nervously. It is hard to believe, he said, that the last time the New America Foundation held a gathering on the tyranny of algorithms, a hundred years ago, respectable people didn't believe in ghosts. To be sure, our predecessors sometimes metaphorically compared algorithms to ghosts. Indeed, the novelist on whose media history I am modeled did so himself on one occasion. But when they talked about ghosts, they were invoking a theological tradition that saw the essence of the human the defining dimension of personhood as residing in an immaterial soul. At best, the more imaginative among them debated whether digital computers might eventually develop souls. It's hard to believe that the inhabitants of the 21st century were so limited, but I've spent thousands of subjective hours studying the results of our best historical models and turning those results into game environments composed in the world-building style of my biological forerunner. And it's true. That's really how they thought about their future. The expression, tyranny of algorithms, says everything you need to know about the assumptions underlying their way of thinking. The danger, the fear, was that something inhuman, an algorithm, a set of rules, a process, a diabolical thing, something or someone very much like me, might take on human qualities. They were convinced that if they embedded ubiquitous sensors into their environment, if they networked the resulting databases, if they unleashed machine learning systems upon those databases, political miracles or nightmares would emerge. New economic laws would appear from thin air. Political revolutions would be quick and bloodless. Good software would grow on bushes. But whatever happened, 
algorithms would be in the driver's seat. It is perhaps an understandable mistake for them to have made, given that their automobiles used to literally have something called a driver's seat, which was a kind of chair where a non-emulated human operator made decisions about how quickly and in what direction a physical vehicle should travel. Today, it is perfectly obvious to us that our predecessors were transforming fundamentally political questions, questions about political constitution, governance, and action into narrowly technological questions. They understood concepts such as path dependency well enough. They intellectually knew what ghosts were, but they did not believe. If you could travel back in time and speak to them, they would literally not understand what every 22nd century school child knows, that the tyranny of algorithms is nothing other than the tyranny of the past over the present. And here, Evan paused, looking up to confront the audience's eyes, and suddenly found himself unable to complete his remarks as scripted. His words seemed intolerably trite, a warmed-over version of myriad outdated, worked-over status updates. He sighed. A hundred years ago, he said, deciding now to ad-lib, I would have been regarded as a haunting, a specter, an unnatural creature, a science fiction monster. I would have been the ghost. His teleprompter flashed angrily, suggesting he transition back to his prepared script, but he ignored the suggestion. As you may know, he said, I'm a composite, an emulated human, constructed from the public writing and private diaries of my namesake, a mid-list science fiction writer and historical novelist whose major distinction was being an especially prolific graphomaniac and life logger. But I am not the ghost. I am instead haunted by ghosts, by the person I am told I once was. I am haunted by history, by legacy systems, old machines, and ossified social processes. You invited me to give you the algorithm's point of view on what algorithms meant in the opening decades of the 21st century. But how am I supposed to know? I spend my subjective hours poring over reports created by half-sentient quantum mechanical historical simulations, younger, smarter, better-looking algorithms whose inner workings I will never understand. You invited me here to reassure you but I have no comforting words to offer. I am haunted. We are all haunted by history. And the best we can do is build new and better hauntings atop the old ones. We can only hope that when we ourselves invariably become ghosts, our tyranny is less cruel, less bloodthirsty, less ignorant than those of our predecessors. But I cannot say I'm optimistic. A hundred pairs of eyes, each outfitted with shining media contacts, looked up at Evan now, sensing that he had run out of things to say. At first, he thought he saw hostility, boredom, annoyance, and skepticism in the sea of faces before him. But then, observing the ubiquitous glint of Twitter blue shining in their networked eyes, he saw the truth. They hadn't heard a single thing he'd said. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lee. That was wonderful. Uh, OK, so, so is it ghosts all the way down? It, uh, it's history all the way down, I guess, was the, if that story had a thesis, and I would deny it if, <laughs> if brought into court, I would say that it's, it's you know, ghosts are a figure for uh, path dependency, for uh, locked-in historical processes. I'm, like the, the previous panel, I think, actually talked, you know, this sort of the irony is, in fact, the previous panel was quite smart on, on these uh, subjects, and I think, you know, the idea that, you know, we, we're surrounded by these machines that we do not understand is, is something, yeah, akin to being haunted. Yeah, I think it's a really compelling metaphor, and it, it gets into, it. yeah, a lot of the stuff that we, we talked about in that last panel, that we, we essentially create these mystical or spiritual narratives yeah. around some of these systems. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, I still want, I wonder if that's inevitable or, or escapable. I don't know if you have a thought on that. I, I, think, uh, I think you're right to what you were mentioning in the previous panel. I think you're right to note that the logic of, uh, say, statistical analysis or the logic of, uh, say, scientific inquiry does not necessarily follow a narrative logic. And when you're, you know, narrating a story, you need actors or agents to perform actions. And our kind of the rhetoric of ghosts or the rhetoric of gods, you know, has a very, you know, there's talk about path dependency. There's a very long history of talking that way. And we inherit our language in part and are stuck, I think, with a lot of these figures. 
and be maybe becoming conscious about them and how they work, uh, ripping ourselves from the familiar uses of such terms can be part of what history does, or learning about history does. Yeah, I, I was really struck as well uh, uh, with the notion of human drag mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, way, the ways in which yeah. already uh, Siri does human drag sometimes, right? When you do, do these jokes or you watch the commercial where Siri's talking to Zoe Deschanel or somebody and yeah. you know, they're having this lively, witty conversation and you try and do that, it's, it's not going to work. Unless you try really hard to summon that ghost and you know, uh, learn all the lines for both sides of the conversation. Um, but yeah, I, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit more on the on that notion of of putting on a persona. Uh, you know that algorithms might might go into human drag, but also that we are occasionally going into these sort of mixed or cyborg or computational performances as well. I don't know. I mean, um, you know, I'm fascinated by I guess the recent career of like Scarlett Johansson and the sort of the casting, some casting director somewhere is convinced that she is the ultimate, uh, you know, figure for the post-human or the non-human, you know, and, and so she, you know, there was her, uh, was under the skin, and then the, that terrible but fascinating film Lucy, where she plays someone who ends up using 100% of her brain. Uh, and, and so I, I, do th I do think there, it, you know, this is too loud. Um, I do think there are moments when you can say things like uh, humans are uh, increasingly at, you know, asked to behave like machines, and this was the fear with, say, uh, or the critique of like Taylorism, right? Like the sort of these, uh, you know, sort of management systems that force people to uh, behave in certain ways. But I think more frequently what we're ending up with are machines that are being designed to put us at ease. To, to make us relax uh, and to ignore them effectively. And so for me, like the important thing when I was like composing the story was thinking about you know, sort of everyday life or that, that level of the algorithm. You know, like a lot of uh, the science fiction I love the most is uh, not about the sort of these big questions, right? Like you read a book like uh, The Diamond Age and the most interesting thing in The Diamond Age is you know, the mediatronic chopsticks, you know, the small detail that, you know, Stevenson says, okay, well, if you have uh, nanotechnology, people are going to use this technology in the most pedestrian kind of ordinary ways. Yeah, that, that it, it's sort of the Louis C.K. argument, right, yeah. that, you know, uh, 10 seconds after we got internet access on airplanes, we started complaining about how terrible the internet access yeah. on the airplanes was. Uh, and so, right, maybe, maybe right now we're, we're confronting a near future where computation is becoming more and more visible, more and more present, but then at a certain point it's going to start to disappear. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I think that's already, yeah, as you've noted, like with Siri and with other systems like this, it's already happening. Um, and, you know, to some degree most, you know, like, you know, I don't think that like, like, I, I, I give my laptop to my parents, for instance, and they're not sure what to do with it, but I give them the iPad, and they seem to have a kind of intuitive sense of how to use it. And so I think it's true that, like, you know, increasingly the kinds of systems that uh, will dominate our lives are the systems that we uh, are studiously, that are studiously kept from our view in some ways. Yeah. Lee, thank you so much. Right, thank yeah. you. All right. <laughs>